Thank you, sis. Thank you, Saskia. I was actually going to correct her if uh, she kept trying to cue me up as a special guest. I'm no special guest. This is my community. And, um, and I'm, I'm a sister uh, in the struggle and in solidarity. Uh, it is my honor to be here. It is my responsibility to be here. And I'm not going to be long because we do want y'all to get on to this ride. Um, but I just want to say this. You know, the, the day of the Derek Chauvin verdict, because again, remember, he was the one on trial, not George Floyd, although they tried to present it otherwise. You know, none of us knew that it was going to happen that quickly. Had I known, maybe I would have approached the day differently. Maybe my meditation and my prayer would have been different for the day. Maybe my journaling would have been different for today, for that day. But then it happened. And I wish the next day that I could have lit a candle and played some Nina Simone about how it's a new dawn, it's a new day. But I didn't feel that way. I wish that I would have awakened the next day and felt safer as a black woman, worried less for my black husband, feared less for our black daughter. That verdict was accountability and it was just one verdict. It was not justice. What black Americans and marginalized communities have experienced for centuries is the very precise, legislated, systematic hurt and harm that was not naturally occurring. It was legislated. It has been codified in statute after statute. I'm glad we're here in the Commonwealth, a place that often likes to be characterized as one of the most progressive states in the country, one of the most progressive cities in the country. But as I always have to remind people, those progressive values that we espouse, we still struggle to practice. Don't forget, I was the first black woman, the first woman of color elected to the Boston City Council, that took 100 years. I'm the first person of color ever and the first black woman to represent the Commonwealth in the House of Representatives, and that took 230 years. Why is that? Because in Boston, throughout the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, which I have the honor of representing, and throughout our Commonwealth, we are very good at celebrating diversity and inclusion. We like hashtags and we like flag raisings and we like parades, but we don't like shared power. There is a culture shift afoot that will lead to a power shift, that will lead to a policy shift. Again, these inequities, these disparities, these racial injustices that have foisted disproportionate harm and hurt amongst black Americans was not naturally occurring. And that is why I say policy is my love language because if we can legislate hurt and harm, then we can and we must legislate equity, legislate healing, legislate justice. I guess we're all here today to do a radical thing, a righteous thing to affirm the humanity and the dignity of every person. To say that we can replace a carceral state, a punitive system in society, we can replace systems and laws of systemic targeted oppression with systems of healing. That we can and we must. Now look, as a lawmaker, I'm used to these unjust binary choices being foisted upon me. So they're always going to say, well, Ayana, how do we pay for it? But no one asked that when we approved, I didn't vote for it, but a $700 billion national defense authorization budget. No one asked that question. When I served on the Boston City Council, and it would be budget time, and they would want me to improve investments in more school police officers when every child in our school district did not have equitable access to a school nurse, a social worker, or a guidance counselor.
counselor. In this country, in the last two decades, we have invested $1 billion in growing our school police to 46,000 strong. When every child does not have equitable access to a school nurse, a social worker. I just wanna say, black boys, black men, you deserve to grow old. That's it. You deserve to grow old. And I wanna say, black girls, you deserve a childhood that is uninterrupted. And those who are trans and LGBTQ and non-binary and gender conforming, you deserve to be. And to not have your existence criminalized. And when your lives are stolen for the stories to never be told and for you to get zero visibility, we've got our work cut out for us. But I do believe another world is possible. And like this sister warrior, a sibling in the movement with me, reminded all of us, the power of the people has always been greater than the people in power. So as I close, I just wanna say, look, Angela Davis, Angela Y. Davis, defines being radical, meaning to get to the root of things. So let us be radical. She also reminds us that people think the social problems go to jail, but human beings do. I know that. I'm the adult child of a formerly incarcerated parent who cycled in and out of the criminal legal system for 14 years because of substance use disorder. My father deserved on-demand, culturally competent treatment, not incarceration. We have got to decriminalize substance use and mental health, and homelessness, and poverty, and blackness. So let us be unapologetic, because I'm gonna tell you the truth, we've been holding space for white fragility for a long time, those of us in this work, and so we have been apologists of our righteous rage and indignation because it's often misunderstood that it comes from a very deep place of radical love. But let's hold space for that righteous rage and indignation. Let's hold space for radical and bold legislative responses. And then the last thing I want y'all to do is to be just as unapologetic in holding space for your radical joy and your healing because you deserve it. I love you all, Black Lives Matter, let's go.